Are you a teacher or a college professor looking to improve the quality of your teaching? I might have something important for you here. As a person who's been teaching for the last several years, there are so many occasions in which I finished a class and I'm so satisfied with the class, there's a sense of great achievement at the end of having conducted such a wonderful class. As a teacher, there's no doubt you've had similar experiences as well. Quite often, after having conducted what I consider to be a really excellent class, I would go back to the following class, ask a few questions, and realize that my students hadn't really understood much. I'm sure you've, as a teacher, experienced similar things, except that your classroom might not have looked like this. Depending upon which part of the world you teach in, your classroom might have looked like this. But my understanding is that this is a pretty common phenomenon. In invoking the painting, Creation of Adam, painted on the ceiling of Sistine Chapel by Michelangelo, I had no doubt wanted to parallel that act to the act of a teacher giving students knowledge. On the other hand, we can also look at the interactions taking place in class as those taking place between humans and extraterrestrials. Except that it's not entirely clear who is the human and who is the extraterrestrial. Of course, to us teachers, the children definitely appear to be from a different planet. To them, on the other hand, we are the aliens. Could look like this or like this. It doesn't matter. But the communication gap between the teachers and students is pretty evident. You've no doubt come across several teachers who in a great state of frustration say students don't care about learning anymore. They just want a job or most of the students we teach are stupid. They don't belong in the classroom anyway. How can we possibly be effective? And this timeless quote, you can only take the horse to the pond. You can't make him drink. But wait a minute. Have you taken a look at things from the horse's point of view? What if the horse can't even figure out where is this pond that you're taking him to? Or what if the water seems to be really dirty and the horse doesn't want to drink it? Or what if the horse drinks the water and finds that it makes him really drowsy and sleepy? So the point is that we teach but often end up failing to reach our students. Surprisingly often, people view the process of teaching as just a matter of pouring knowledge into students' heads. Don Finkel refers to this process as teaching as telling. A number of people view the process of teaching as simply a matter of standing in front of class and telling students whatever it is they want to communicate to them. Unfortunately, teaching as telling simply results in words going in through one ear and coming out through the other. Ideally, we would like teaching to result in what one might call as effortless memory. That is, students will remember what was taught, would have internalized what was taught, and can recall it or apply it without really having to go through a great deal of effort. It's become so much a part of them because they were so engaged that it results in effortless memory. And the second thing, of course, is that we would want people to be able to apply the knowledge and understanding to new situations. The wonderful book, Education for Judgment, The Artistry of Discussion Leadership, compares and contrasts traditional pedagogy or the old approach to teaching against the new challenge. According to them, the old approach to teaching, conventional pedagogy, viewed teaching as simply telling and viewed knowledge as facts and learning as mere recall of facts. The new challenge according to them is that teaching is really a process of enabling students. It's not a matter of telling students about various facts and various pieces of information and various concepts. Instead, it is enabling students to construct that knowledge for themselves. And knowledge is not really facts. However, it is understanding. And finally, the process of learning is not just a matter of recall, but it's the active construction of the subject matter by the student. And finally, one more observation from the book. Retention increases markedly when learning is anchored in the experience and interests of students. So we are then interested in the question, 
how do people learn? The common wisdom which underlies conventional pedagogy is that people listen to words that other people speak and learning occurs in the process. In reality, people construct knowledge based on their experiences. In other words, knowledge is not something that is received from others. Instead, knowledge is something that people construct for themselves out of experiences. I think this is a fundamental shift from the old pedagogical approaches to, to new pedagogical approaches. So given that knowledge is not something that is transmitted from one person to another, what then is our job as teachers? Our job as teachers then becomes one of creating an environment in which people have useful experiences which make them think. So how do we create an environment in which people have useful experiences? We do that by giving students genuine problems to work on. What are genuine problems? First of all, they have to deal with interesting situations. By interesting, we mean situations that interest the students, not interest the teachers, but something to which the students can really pay attention, something that students can get engaged in, something that they can care about. And the situation should be something that stimulates thought about whatever it is that we are trying to teach them. And of course, students should be able to get the necessary information with which they can solve the problem or it could be that they already have the necessary information and can go ahead and work on the problem. And of course, students work on developing solutions and then they test the effectiveness of their solutions by applying whatever they find to the real world and seeing if the problem got solved. So let's recap what we have looked at so far. The first important point is that knowledge is not transferred from one person to another. Instead, people construct knowledge for themselves based on their experiences. What this tells us is that our job as educators is to create environments where learning occurs rather than trying to convey the learning all by ourselves by telling and talking. And therefore, this requires us to pose genuine problems for students, problems that can engage the students and then let the problem take care of teaching students the concepts. And of course, we are there on the side to help them whenever they have difficulties with the problem. This process is what is sometimes called as action learning. That is, people learn by doing. And our job is simply to facilitate the process. People often refer to applying these approaches as changing the process of teaching from being the sage on the stage to becoming the guide on the side. Let's now turn our attention to another very important aspect of teaching effectiveness and that is the use of what education literature calls as learning outcomes. Most of the time when we think about teaching, we think about what are the topics that we are going to cover, right? So if we take a course, we start planning the course by saying, what are the topics I'm going to include in my course and what are the topics I'm going to exclude? That approach has been employed for several decades, perhaps several centuries, and is what might be called as a teacher-centric approach. It's talking about what is it that the teacher plans to do. As a teacher, I'll cover these topics and I'll have lectures on these days, I'll have case studies on those other days, I'll have discussions on some days, and I'll have guest lecturers on certain days, etc. All of this is a very teacher-centric approach. Instead, learning outcomes try to focus on rather than defining the course in terms of topics and what the teacher will do, they tend to define the course in terms of what are the outcomes of the course. And we want to talk about outcomes in terms of what should the student be able to do at the end of the course or at the end of a lecture or at the end of a topic. So the focus is more on the student and this can drastically change how we view our courses. Okay, so that's a big contrast moving from what can I, what, what will I do as a teacher to what should the student be able to do 
after I have completed the course. So when we consider what should the student be able to do after having studied a topic or the whole course or some aspect of the course, what should the student be able to do? Now when we talk about what should the student be able to do, very often we find that learning outcomes are listed by teachers in the following form. After completing the course, the student will understand something. The student will appreciate something and so on. Right? Now when we define learning outcomes in terms of verbs like understand and appreciate and so on, that is not very concrete. Right? Now what do you mean by students should understand something? Right? Suppose a student has understood it. How will we be able to observe that the student has actually understood that? We cannot go peer into the student's mind into the brain and find out whether they have understood a topic or not. Right? So it's a very important practice to define learning outcomes in terms of what a student can do that we can observe. Right? So that, that becomes explicit. You can say at the end of this the student will be able to list two properties of this. The student will be able to apply this principle to problems of this particular nature or the student will be able to write something and so on. Now all of these are activities which we can observe the student doing or we can observe the result of their performing these activities and therefore it makes it possible for us to measure whether the learning outcome has actually been attained or not. Otherwise we cannot successfully measure the learning outcome and therefore we don't know if the learning outcome has been achieved or not. That's a very important point that a learning outcome should be stated in terms of what a student can observably do which we can then measure and see if the outcomes have been achieved or not. That's a very important part of assessment of the success of a course. When we talk about learning outcomes and specifying learning outcomes in terms of things that we can actually observe and measure, we now come to the important point about what do we really want students to be able to do at the end of a certain course? Very often, if you seriously look at courses, you'll find that most of the learning outcomes in courses are focused only on recalling certain things. Right? And this typically happens when learning outcomes are not formally defined. So informally, what happens is that most of the time we end up simply testing for recall of knowledge. Recall of knowledge is important, but we really want students to have a much deeper understanding of our subject matter. And here we come to the topic of what are called, what is called the Bloom's hierarchy of learning, of learning outcomes. Okay. So as you can see from this diagram, you can classify what you want students to learn in terms of lower order thinking skills and higher order thinking skills. Right? At the lowest level, we want people to be able to simply recall certain things. Okay, So you've taught a subject, let's say you've taught them about flowers and after that lecture you want them to be able to say, okay, what are the parts of a flower? What are the different types of flowers? And so on and so forth. What is the definition of a flower? Things like that. These are simply things that students recall. They just remember it, they've memorized it, they remember it, they can recall it when asked. So that is the lowest level of a learning outcome when you can say people should be able to remember certain things. That is, retrieve the relevant knowledge from their long-term memory. Commit things to their memory and recall them when needed. The second level in the Bloom's hierarchy or the Bloom's taxonomy of learning outcomes is understanding the thing. Not just being able to recall it, but actually understand the meaning of whatever concept or thing that they have been taught, right? Which means that if you give them, uh, if you uh, give them something that is wrong, they'll be able to recognize that what you've shown them is wrong. They'll be able to say what is right. They'll be able to explain the concept in many different ways and so on and so forth, right? All of which you can observe them doing and therefore you know they've understood it. Right? So there are many different ways in which you can lay out learning outcomes that can test the people's uh, students' understanding of a certain concept as opposed to merely remembering concepts.
Of course, it's very easy to write learning outcomes for testing remembering because all you have to do is see if they are able to retrieve and recall certain things. Right? So the next higher level of the taxonomy talks about students being able to apply concepts that they have learned. Right? So not only can they recall it, not only do they understand it, they can now apply it in a certain situation. Okay. So they can solve problems using this or they can go out into the real world and apply the concept and so on. So that is applying the concept. The next higher level is analyzing some learning. Right? That is they've been taught something. They can explain what are the various parts of it. They, they can break it up into its component parts. They understand the relationship of one part to another. They understand the impact that one part has on another and so on and so forth. Right? So that is the next level. They can apply it and then they can break it down into its component parts and they understand the relationships across the different parts of whatever we are talking about. The next higher level of the taxonomy talks about students being able to evaluate something. Right? So that is, not only do they have the ability to apply something and to analyze it, but they can also make judgments on it. So for example, suppose you've taught them how to write. What is the structure of an essay? Right? So they understand what are the structure, what is the structure. So they'll be able to tell you these are the parts of an essay. They understand the parts, which is they know what is the introduction, what is the middle part, what is the conclusion, etc. They can apply it in the sense that they can, you know, write an essay. They can apply these various parts, right? Or given an essay, they'll be able to tell you, which is analyzing what are the different parts of the essay, which is the introduction, which is the conclusion, etc. Evaluating comes from the ability of students to be able to say whether something is good or not good. What is the quality of what has been given to them? Right? So if given, the, given an essay, they'll be able to read it, evaluate it, and then tell you, this is good, these are the weaknesses, these are the strengths, this is how it can be improved, and so on and so forth. Okay? And the highest level in the taxonomy is when students create original work. Right? So you've taught them something and then based on that, they are now able to create new knowledge. Right? Or in the case of uh, uh, you know, uh, music and so on, they're able to create pieces of music. In the case of writing, they're actually able to write something creative and so on. Okay? So you can see that when we talk about knowledge, when we talk about teaching students something, we are really looking at many different levels at which we want them to learn certain things. So when we have a course, we may say some of the topics in the course, we want to go only up to the level of understanding. Some of the other topics, we want them to go up to the level of being able to apply it. And some of the topics, we may want them to be able to go to the level of evaluating. And maybe in certain advanced courses, we want them to go to the level of being able to create things for themselves. right? And for each of these levels, we can write the learning outcomes that we expect our students to be able to achieve. So when you look at things in such a detailed manner using the Bloom's taxonomy of learning outcomes, then you can clearly see that we can define our courses in a much, much sharper way than by just saying these are the topics I'm going to cover. Right? So if we sit down before a course or before a session and think carefully about what is it that we want the students to be able to do at each of these levels, and we are able to define that concretely, then when we go into the classroom, we have a really good idea of what is it we want to achieve during a particular session. We have a concrete idea, we can test it, we can give students tasks to perform so that we can uh, make sure that they understand all of these things, and at the end of it, we'll be able to see how far have we achieved our goals. Okay? So using learning outcomes is a very, very important aspect of teaching effectiveness, because it really tells us what exactly are we trying to achieve here. And of course, we are doing it from the point of view of not just what is it that we want to do, but what is it that we want our students to be able to successfully do at the end of a session or a course or whatever. And once we have it concrete, we can measure it.
So learning outcomes become a really important aspect of teaching effectiveness. So we've seen by now that people construct knowledge for themselves by having their own experiences and therefore our job is to design experiences which have very good learning value, which have very good teaching value. Right? Suppose we do that. However, students are not going to learn unless they get engaged in whatever learning experiences we have designed for them. So let's look at some techniques for engaging students, making them interested in the topic that is being discussed. One thing that students, uh, teachers often make a mistake on is that they tend to get really abstract in what they are talking about. Because the subject matter is so close to their own heart, they understand it so very well, that it becomes difficult for them to think about how, the, how alien that concept is to somebody who is encountering it for the first time. So they tend to make it really abstract. Instead, if we try to make whatever it is we are talking about extremely concrete, so that people can relate to it. So for example, if we are able to tie it to uh, some, some activity that students do on a daily basis, if you are able to tie whatever it is you are describing to a game that the students are familiar with and they play on a daily basis, or if you are able to relate it to, uh, to their bus ride as they come to school and so on, right? then students have a point from which they can relate to the subject matter and it makes things really concrete for them to understand. And of course, we can make things concrete by uh, bringing models, you know, showing physically what a thing's lo thing looks like or relating it to something that they already know. Uh, so one of the biggest mistakes that uh, we as teachers tend to make is that we talk in abstract terms, things that students cannot relate to and therefore students are unable, even if they make the effort, they're unable to understand what we are trying to teach them. The second important principle is that the human brain is naturally tuned to look out for unexpected elements or surprises. This is understandable because the human brain is built as a survival mechanism. We are always uh, wanting to protect ourselves and not get injured or not die. So therefore, and of course we know that uh, danger lies in something that is unexpected. If it is expected then it's not dangerous anymore because you can deal with it. So the human brain is extremely sensitive to surprise and unexpected things, right? So therefore, this is a principle we can exploit in the classroom by starting off the class with some unexpected fact or by saying something which seems completely counterintuitive to their students, right? So it becomes completely unexpected or saying something that looks like it's totally wrong, but is in fact correct. Right. So once we put the class in that kind of a state, the students are automatically engaged because they want to know the answer. It's unexpected. They've encountered something and their brain is tuned to want to resolve this. This is something we can exploit to get their attention. Okay, That's very important. The second part also is that conflict is something that always makes the human mind pay attention. Naturally, when there's conflict, because we are expecting that it can result in some danger, so we have to be careful to find out what's going on. So the human brain is, is tuned to be aware of conflict and to pay attention to conflict and perhaps try to resolve. This is also something that we can exploit. Uh, in fact, studies have shown that two classrooms with identical level of teachers, identical level of students, but one classroom is conducted in which the, the teacher creates conflict, not real fights, but you know, presents something and then says, how many of you agree? How many of you disagree? Some students agree, some students disagree, and then there's conflict, right? Because now you've got two sets of people and they have different viewpoints and students are immediately keen to find out why is it that these people who play with me on a regular basis, who travel by bus to school with me, who eat with me at the cafeteria, how is it that they can have different viewpoints or a different assessment of this subject than I have? Right. So there's a conflict there and they want the conflict to be resolved or they want to find out why it exists. Their interest is perked up and they pay a lot of attention. So this is also something uh, that can be used as a technique to gather students' attention and to gather their engagement. Perhaps the best attention gathering technique is that of stories. The human brain once again seems to be exquisitely tuned to stories. It can listen to long stories 
and it can remember lots of details from even complicated stories right this also looks like it's got a an evolutionary purpose to it that is because before perhaps written language existed knowledge had to be transmitted from uh, you know generation to generation just by word of mouth and perhaps people found that stories were a really effective mechanism to uh, transmit this kind of knowledge whatever it is uh, we seem to be very finely tuned to listen to stories and this is something we can exploit in the classroom because if we are able to frame whatever topic we are talking about in the form of a story then students are naturally going to be attentive because they want to know how the story ends we can easily do this uh, by tying the topic to something that is related to the story so for example if it's a physics class we could talk about uh, you know we could tie the class to a story of the person who invented a certain concept or discovered the concept or principle and then we could have some suspense out there which is then resolved only later in the class right so that's an important thing that students will then always be wanting to know how does this end how does this end so they're going to be listening and paying attention right through so if there's an activity they have to perform in order to find out the answer to the uh, to the mystery that has been posed at the beginning of class then students are likely to take the activity more seriously and carry it out so that they find out what really happened this is a very important and effective mechanism in class okay so that's something also that uh, that people can use in fact while talking about conflict uh, i omitted to mention that screenwriters that is people who write screenplays for films at least the good screenwriters they employ conflict whenever they want to communicate any information to us right in fact if you go back and look at some of the movies you'll find that there are lots of places where the screenwriter has created a conflict the conflict may not even have any connection to the real story of the movie but they've created the conflict because they want you to pay attention to some information that's being communicated there so according to them information in a movie has to be a byproduct of conflict because they understand that people pay attention to conflict okay so these are some important techniques that we can use to make our classes much more engaging to students in this context i would definitely like to recommend the book made to stick by chip heath and dan heath it's a wonderful book that talks about several techniques that we can use to make our ideas stick that is to make the ideas memorable that people will remember them and people will act upon them and people will be persuaded by them so that is something that i would strongly recommend people to take a look at so what are the important points we have discussed in this talk first of all we have learned that people construct knowledge for themselves we cannot put knowledge into people's heads and therefore the job of a teacher is to create an environment where students can learn to create experiences for them which have teaching value in the process of doing something people learn rather than by sitting passively and listening to us right this is what we call as active learning or action learning that's a very important principle that we have discussed the second thing we talked about was to be aware of learning outcomes that is orienting our courses our topics our lectures from the viewpoint of after i finish this what will the student be able to do which i can observe rather than saying what is it that i as a teacher will do a very student oriented outcome a student oriented approach and we also saw that in this process we could define learning as occurring in several levels as defined by the bloom's taxonomy of learning and once we have a concrete understanding of what exactly we want students be able to be able to do and how can we observe them doing it or observe the products of their doing it so that we can measure how successful we have been once we have a clear understanding of this then we'll find that our classes and our courses are much more concrete much more clearly defined and therefore uh, we are able to achieve our results that much better so that was the second point and finally the third point we discussed was what are the techniques that we can use to engage students the first thing we said is always try to make anything you're talking about very concrete so that people can relate to it 
The second point was try to use conflict and try to use unexpectedness in order to get students' attention and retain their attention. And finally, we said the use of stories is a very useful technique to gather people's attention, to retain their attention right through and for enhancing their retention of various concepts that have been taught. So those are all the things I want to talk about. Uh, I also referred to the book, you know, Made to Stick, which talks about what are the properties of ideas that really stick in people's minds. Uh, so those are all the things I would like to leave you with. Thank you very much for listening.